life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. And welcome to another season of Sunday of the Dead for The Walking Dead Season 3. We're starting a brand new season. I have a cup of tea because guess what? Even though it's September, it is fall to me. Anyone yeah. else? This year has had its allergies go all over the place because of that stupid Saharan dust storm. So like... Some days I'm nothing. Some days, like today, I'm all gunked up and I can't see. How about you, Corey? Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad today. This time of year always feels to me like time for The Walking Dead because of the whole autumn aspect of it. And I will say that we just started watching season 11. Is that the season yep. that's out right now? The last we season. just started watching that concurrently. Well, at least Corey and I did. I'm glad we're kind of watching this while we're doing this because I think it's going to give us a lot of insight into the things that we're seeing in this episode and this season mm -hmm. and... And you know what I'm Yeah, saying. I was worried that it was going to get confusing watching the two at the same time, but it wasn't. It was like there's at a point of tension in season 11 right now, and going back and watching Rick and then Carl starting to get his come into his own was actually refreshing. So I actually enjoyed doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's start talking about this episode, which is episode one, and it's called Seed. We'll talk about what that means a little more later as we have gone through the episode. The third season premiere aired on AMC in the United States and Canada on October 14th, 2012. The episode was written by showrunner Glenn Mazzara and directed by Ernest Dickerson. It broke several records when it reached 10.9 million views becoming the most watched scripted drama telecast on a basic cable network in history and the most watched episode of the series to date, surpassing the previous record held by the season two finale, Beside the Dying Fire. And I would like to say that I feel like this always happens at the beginning of the season, especially when it starts in the fall, because people get in the mood for like these kind of spooky shows. Uh, Comic-Con is definitely drumming things up in the summertime. So I believe, you know, people really start off the season strong <laughs> to watch the show. But even though it was high, it's still the sixth lowest rated season premiere episode of the series. So as we go on, the season premiere episodes are going to get larger, which is crazy to me, really. Season two was the season where everyone I talked to dropped off. If they dropped off the show, they dropped off on season two. It being low makes sense because oh, I people gotcha. dropped off I of gotcha. season two. And I feel like as the series went on, they got better at making cliffhanger endings mm -hmm. where season one didn't really have a cliffhanger. Season two, again, didn't fully have a cliffhanger. They ended the series in a way that they're like, we can end here if we right. wanted to. Then they start doing real cliffhanger mm -hmm. endings. And as I was telling Corey and Marshall, I started re-watching The Walking Dead uh, previously, before we started this podcast, I had gotten up to episode two of the season and stopped. So after we get through episode two, it will be the first time I have watched the series more than once. Right now, I'm co I've probably watched them a few times. One thing you do need to know about this episode is that it is set eight months after we see the farm burn in last season's finale. So they have been legitimately wandering around for eight months in a circle. And I also want to remind you all that in that last episode, you saw the prison, which was a little bit off in the distance from where they were, but not totally far. But they still haven't found that prison in eight months. And we're going to get to why that is in mm -hmm. a little while. Right. All right, let's start this episode. In the opening scene, you are kind of being zoomed out away from what looks like an eye. 
And as you continue to zoom, you realize that it is a zombie eye. So something that's really interesting about the scene that we're going to probably talk about in a different episode is that as it's panning out to show the walker's face, this is also done in another episode. So the final episode for this season starts out the same way, but when the camera pans out, it reveals the governor's face. It's possibly a metaphor for how the show starts off with walkers being the biggest danger to the group and ends with them learning that other people are often a greater threat to them. Now, I get a lot of these notes from like, again, Wikipedia or IMDb or just basic internet searches. So a lot of other people have found these tidbits that I'm sharing with you. They're not all me or all Marshall or all Corey, but I find that to be very true. I think this is the season where walkers, while still in ever present danger, are not as dangerous as a human. They become a part of the environment. They're no longer a dynamic threat. So after we pan away from the walkers, we see that they are in a house and they're just kind of in there like and the door busts open and the first people through the door are Rick and T-Dog and they just start wailing on those walkers. And like you can see just a half second before it cuts, you can see Daryl and Carl coming in right behind them. Mm -hmm. So this particular house is at 735 Reese Road, and it is in Sonoya, Georgia. I was able to see the house on Google Maps. It's still there. It looks very run down, but it's still there right off the road. I, I probably spent a good 30 minutes just trying to figure out where, because it's set back a lot from the road. Uh, it is covered by trees. If you didn't just stumble across it, you would drive by and be, wouldn't even know it was there, really. They are casing the house to see if they can find more walkers. Are there food? Are there bad people holding up somewhere, really? Rick finds this linen closet with this weird secret door. As I'm watching, because obviously I don't really know what's going on at this point, right? We're just watching the episode. I notice there's like a half flat of water bottles that are on the shelf to his left. And I'm like, well, if you're scavenging, shouldn't you be taking that water? Because that water is always helpful. But then I realized that they're, they're planning on staying there, so they don't. But as we come to find out, this was a bad move on his part, not taking those waters. Yeah. So then he starts to continue through this weird linen closet, and there is a door at the end, and he opens it up, and it's Daryl from another part of the house. They continue to go on a house sweep. Carl goes into a room, sees a walker, shoots it in the head. And what we can see here is that he's got a makeshift suppressor on his gun. As far as I can tell, it's just a Glock, but the suppressor that he's using is made from a steel water bottle that has either been somehow welded or duct taped to the end of the gun. Mm, And you can find instructions on how to make these on the internet, but they aren't very durable. Mm -hmm. They're not designed to last for long term. What I'm surprised by is that we don't see this very much in the series. If you know that these walkers are being drawn by the the noise, why not suppress all of your weapons? Rick Rick is suppressed in this scene too. Yes. Rick actually has a professional silencer attached. Mm. Yeah. So Daryl and T-Dog go upstairs, and at the same time, we see Glenn and Maggie coming in the back door, and I think one of them has a shovel. I can't remember who. It's Glenn. So then T-Dog is in a bedroom by himself. Daryl goes into another room, and he sees a live owl that's kind of perched on the back of the chair, and he shoots it. Poor owl. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because, you know, food. And then Rick goes to the door, whistles for the rest of the group, and we see Carol, Beth, Lori, and Herschel. At this point, Carl enters the kitchen and then they try to scavenge the house for things to eat because at this point, they're running out of food. They're running really low on food. There is a can of smeat on the counter. And this is the same word that they used on Waterworld when they showed the can of supposed spam. Mm -hmm. They called it smeat. It's probably like soy meat. Probably. (laughs) It also looks like there's an empty jar of peanut butter and four, like, coffee or tea mugs on there. But we have to wait for pudding. Carl opens a cabinet and finds champion pebbles, which I think from the picture of the dog is dog food. And technically, dog food is edible 
in short term. I would not continue eating it for the long term because, and if you do eat it, you should cook it first because dog food has a higher risk of foodborne illness for humans. The FDA doesn't govern dog food as much as it does human food. And Mm -hmm. as we can see, they don't really govern human food all that much either. I didn't really pay that much attention to the can of meat, but it did not look open to me. So that's why I was like, wait, so Carl ends up choosing these cans of dog food over the meat, which to me, the meat is food. He seems very happy with himself. The group starts to get into the living room and hunker down a little bit. And he is so excited that he found these, like he, he's proud of himself, right? So he starts trying to open it. And then Rick looks at it, takes it, and throws it across the room because it's not real food. At this point, I want to bring up that there has not been one word uttered by anyone. Yeah, and when you're looking around the room, as he walks up and he chucks the can, everybody's kind of looking at him in different ways. Like, some of them are disappointed, and obviously they're all hungry, but some of them are like, uh, is he about to start yelling at us? Right. They've got this look like he's about to snap. He's going to lose it. Yeah. And through the window behind T-Dog, you can see some walkers in the yard. Now, I get this. It doesn't look like the walkers are totally coming for them, though. But I guess if it's a herd, they're afraid. They're taking precautions. I'm calling it herd TSD. Uh, That's what they have. They just, you know, even though it was eight months ago, they just went through that big herd situation that it was the first time they'd ever been surrounded like that. Right. So they're still in flight mode, not fight mode. Even though... Later on, we find out, like, if you're hungering down in that house and you just don't make any noise for a while, the walkers might not care. But if it's a herd, it might surround you. So I get it. They decide to err on the side of caution, and they exit through the back door and start running to the cars. As they're going out, you can see some blue tennis shoes on a mound of dirt at the back door. Maggie sees an axe by the side of the house and runs to grab it. Oh, oh, look. We're learning, people. Yes. <laughs> we used to just bypass those shovels and axes that we saw laying around, and now they're like, stock up. <laughs> this is also kind of marking Maggie starting to grow in importance to the group, where before she was the the Glen of the farm fam. Mm-hmm. Now she is growing in importance to the group. So she grabs this axe, but we don't ever actually see her use it too much. But the axe this is the symbol. Mm-hmm. The axe is a symbol of leadership, which she does later on become a very major and awesome leader. Right. So as the cars are driving away, the walkers begin to follow them down the road. And then we go into an intro. So this is a different intro than the first two seasons. And we're going to talk about what we see here and who they correspond to. So the first shot is of the highway with lots of cars. This is the highway that we saw when they are near Herschel's farm, the one where they have the horde and all that other jazz. Then you see Rick Sheriff's badge and a fence post with nails. Obviously, this is symbolic of Rick. They show Andrew Lincoln. They show his name right during this. So we know that's a Rick correlation. Then we see gun shells with a centipede crawling around it. And the two names that they flash are the actresses who play Lori and Andrea in this shot. And that kind of makes me think, because we've already kind of associated Andrea with guns. She's been very much about guns. So those two gun shells may be representing Andrea, but if Lori is also being represented in this scene, does that mean she's being represented by the centipede? Yeah, that was my question. Well, here's the thing. Later on, there is a scene where she's wondering what she has inside her. And oh, yeah. There's a creep factor to That's it. That's terrifying. So, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> the next shot is two arrows in a tree, and that is representing Daryl. Norman Reedus shows up. Then we see the farmhouse, which is Herschel's farmhouse. There are no actor or actress names during this shot. Then there is a watch with spitting hands that's Stephen Yoon, who is Glenn. And that's ju- true. Just for clarification, it's pronounced Yun. That watch is supposed to be Herschel's watch that he gave to Glenn. Then we see a cemetery with Maggie's name, Lauren Cohen. Thoughts about that one? Well, the family. Yeah. Family's dead. There's people oh, yeah. in the family. The next shot is some Cherokee roses. And then that you see that in the foreground and it kind of like zooms out and you can see behind them an abandoned house. And that is Carl 
And then we see another shot of feet shadows under a door, which is... Deny Guerrera. Right. And that is Michonne. Mm -hmm. Then we see a walker eyeball. Hate that one. (laughs) Then an inside of a rundown cabin and a forest. So those are the only names that they do flash on the screen. Everyone else happens like after the credits where they have the names that kind of run as the episode itself is going. Then they show you Esco Feed Mill. And the sign says Esco Feed Mill Perina Chows. This is an actual place. They use it for a lot of different scenes through the season and a little into next season. It is at 16 Lion Creek Road, Sonoya, Georgia. Yes, you can take a tour. So I was, I'm like, ooh, we should go, go look at this one. There is a storefront with an American flag on it. There is inside of a prison, it looks like. It isn't. Because if you look, there's a whole bunch of hooks hanging up the higher portions of the wall and the foreground is actually the saw that we see in the very next shot but those hooks and the mattress that you see there are out of Michonne's hideout that we're going to see later in the episode I'm going to give you a little tip it's the same place oh that both things are because and we'll talk about this later that the prison is actually built in a sound studio that is probably also built at the sound studio because when I was watching some of the special features and deleted scenes, it looked like it was in the same area. So, yes, you're right. It is mm-hmm. representative of Michonne's hideout, but it's also... That's kind of fun, that they're both the same place. Just yeah, anything right. that's indoors, you can probably count on mm-hmm. that it's an actual studio, yeah. not a location. So then we see some kind of, like, saw, like, like hand saw. Yeah. It was also present in the previous shot, but you were so close that you could barely understand what it was. Mm. This is also very ominous for Herschel, the one-legged wonder. Right. Then there's some trees, the prison guard tower, and then a large shot of the prison. Because you know where this is taking place this season. Primarily the prison. And you can see like the shots of places that we have throughout without anybody's names on them. It's actually kind of showing the journey that Mm. they've had so far. So you have the highway because they were running. Then they go to the farmhouse. Then they are running from place to place as they're going to different rundown cabins. They're in the forest. They're they're going to the mill. These are all the places that they've been hiding out as Mm -hmm. in the last eight months. After this set of credits, they stop the cars on a road. The location of this is Crick Road, Sonoya, Georgia. So everything is really taking place around the same area in Sonoya as they're filming it. They all get out of the cars on the road. So, as we like to do, we like to tell you who's riding in what car. Now, this was really hard because (laughs) we saw who got in like one of the cars, but then getting out of the cars, we couldn't necessarily see where some of the people were. So we, Marshall and I both separately and together spent a lot of time pausing, supposing, running and, it back and forth. And the shot where they're actually all getting out of the cars is so far away that you're having to try and figure out, okay, well, whose hair is that? I can't tell, who, who, whose height right. is that? And then when you get to the very next shot, they're all moved around. Exactly. So let's start with the green car because we saw people get into the green car. Maggie got in the driver's side back seat. Glenn was in the passenger seat and Herschel was in the passenger back seat. But we didn't see who got into the driver's seat of the green car. But later on, when you see everyone get out of the car, you see that Rick is actually in front of Maggie when they're walking to the front of the car. So we're like, well, I, we think Rick mm-hmm. drove the green car, which makes no sense to us about why you've got all these strong people in that one car and then they have these other people in the other vehicles, which we'll show you. Obviously, Daryl is on his bike. Always. <laughs> yeah. Then we have a red truck. And in the red truck is Carol and Beth and Lori. And Judith. And the baby. I believe that the reason why Carol and Lori are in this truck by themselves with no real fighters, as Carol is not there yet, it's because of some dynamics that are happening between Rick, Carl, and Lori right now. 
And also, as we will find out, Carol has a little bit of knowledge. If something happens and Lori goes into labor, she can also help. And they're probably, you know, having their their mutual woman supportive system happening in that car as well. Mm -hmm. So then in the silver truck is T-Dog is driving and Carl is in the passenger site. That was probably the hardest one. We knew, T well, I thought T-Dog was in the red truck for the longest time until yeah. we figured out he had to be the one driving that truck. At this point, Rick utters the first word of this episode. Besides the pst that T-Dog did when he saw the walkers at the window, the, this is the first word and the word is 15. He's saying this to Carl, he goes like, okay, it's 15, you're on watch duty. My real question was, why? Why did they choose to do this? Not have any dialogue in the beginning of the episode until Ooh. now. That was my question. I think it's more dynamic. I think it shows, it kind of shows what level they're at. Where they're at in their ability to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I think it shows that there's a little bit more time and that they have some skills. They're developing some skills of how to clear a building that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if that was the intention, but that definitely just displayed that without any words. And it also shows that they're they're learning not to be noisy. Again, it reinforces that they know how to take care of themselves. I feel like it's also something else. It's about tension. Like there's this silence in among them because of their trauma. And I think this is also kind of going back to how they were all looking at Rick in a very scared manner like some of them were looking at him very tensely because they're traumatized they're afraid that he's going to snap at them again mm -hmm. the silence could also be indicative of that trauma mm. so they decide to consult a map and talk about how there are a lot of herds of walkers coming from different directions they say they are trying to go south Durrell says that the herd was about 150 but Glenn says, well, it's been a little while, so it could be twice that now. Mm -hmm. They address the fact that it's been eight months by saying they spent the winter going in circles. And they spent this time going through the burnt out farms looking for supplies and looking for shelter. We already know from previous episodes that all the farms in the areas are burnt out. Mm -hmm. So they literally just kept on wandering in circles looking for any house they could get. And you could see that also on the map as they did various search circles written on the maps. Mm -hmm. So then they decide after much discussion that they're going to instead head west. And they're very concerned about how Lori could give birth any day now. Like she's ready to pop. And you see her in the passenger seat of the red truck. Like she's just, she looks tired. She looks, you know, she's probably out of energy because they haven't eaten anything. Yeah, it, it's kind of a dangerous time for her really. Mm -hmm. So then Daryl says to Rick, while the others wash their panties, let's go hunt. <laughs> well, well <laughs> okay, Daryl. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I get where he's trying to get at. He's like, well, everybody takes care of themselves and makes themselves feel better. Let's go figure out something actually useful. But his his choice of words is not good. No, see, I, I kind of took it more as the others have crapped their pants. Mm. It is now time for them to wash their pants. Let's go hunt. <laughs> you know, like That's how I took it. So they are in a forest walking along a railroad track. They stumble upon, finally, the prison. And you can <laughs> see Rick's face. He's looking at the prison. He's getting ideas. There's a little, like, smirk kind of happening. Daryl just looks skeptical about the whole situation. Like, what? You want us to, really? A prison? You know, thinking about him and, you know, I have no idea how much time he has actually spent behind bars, but I just get the feeling he probably did spend some time behind bars at some point. He probably like, went to juvie. Just a lockup of an order overnight even. I don't even know. But yeah, he looks like kind of like, huh? Okay. There's also a lot of walkers in the yard of the prison. But then you get, you get the shot back at Rick and he just looks like he found his dream home. Which brings us to our brand new segment, House Hunters Apocalypse Edition. So when it comes to places to hole up for the apocalypse, there's this hierarchy of places that you actually want to be looking for. Wherever you go, there are certain things that you need, like you need it to be easily defensible, you need it to be loaded with supplies, and you want a fair amount of space for farming and for crafting. And a lot of people are going to think, oh, let's go to like Walmart and the big box stores and those places that are going to have a huge amount of supplies and space. 
but they are terrible. You really want to avoid them. Uh, everyone is going to head there first to loot because everybody thinks of those first. So then they're going to be scavenged out by the time you get there. They're going to have zombies. They're going to have baddies all over the place. So just avoid these like the plague. They're also almost impossible to defend because even those rolling metal doors can be broken through really easily. The next thing on the list, residential homes and apartments. Good for scavenging, but don't stay there. Can't defend them. Not, not for very long. Hospitals have all the supplies you could ever want, plenty of room, lots of tools, but again, not defensible. And typically, they're going to have all the zombies starting there. Schools are actually a really good spot. Many times they're built to keep unwanted adults out, and they have a cafeteria and a nurse's office, so you have lots of good supplies. They have shops and labs to craft in. The problem is you won't find any weapons, and the defenses are only designed to keep people out that are trying to sneak in. I have to break in here and say that in the neighborhood that we live in, and you know, y'all don't get any ideas, but <laughs> I know I'm probably giving this away. In the neighborhood that we live in, we actually have a middle school that's like literally in the same parking lot as a Hobby Lobby and Academy Sports and many restaurants. So I feel like this would be the perfect place to hole up in. I mean, granted, a lot of other people will have the same idea, especially because there is a firehouse right across the street. And a prison. Great. Not too far. And a away, prison, but... not too far. So, you know, I think yes. we're in a good spot. You you don't have a bad spot. And actually, yeah, like I said, this is actually the, the probably the second best option, schools. The main issue is that their defenses are not designed to keep people out that are actually wanting in. All it takes is one good vehicle ramming through a gate and it's done. And now you have zombies coming in. Right. People will often think that military bases are a great place to go. You know, Shane thought that for most of season one and two. But again, everybody is going to be wanting to go there. So right. even though they are good for keeping marauders out, they're going to get overwhelmed really quickly and you're not going to be able to get in. That actually leaves prisons. Prisons are designed to keep people out that are very intent on getting in. They have commissaries that are designed for massive amounts of people. They have even better nurses stations than a school will. Mm -hmm. They will have weapons. They will have tons of area. They have everything you want. There's only one downside. The previous tenants. Right. Any prisoners that are still alive, you're going to have to find a way to deal with them one way or the other. Now this could mean you have a built-in colony. It could mean you have a whole bunch of enemies that you're going to have to shank. Also, they can be blocked off into kill zones. Many of them are designed so you can just take whole hallways and just block them off and kill anybody that comes through. Great for zombies. And many of these prisons, especially in Georgia and Florida, are changing over to a solar power system. Mm. So free power forever. They're been one of the best shelters in an apocalypse if you can clear it. Huh. Well, this prison our prison for this season is the sign says that it is West Georgia correctional facility. This prison actually resides at Raleigh Studios at 600 Chesselhurst Road in Sonoya. No, they did not film at a real prison. <laughs> the creator, Robert Kirkman, considers the prison to be a character in this show. The prison set was actually designed by a walker. Her name was Graham Grace Walker, and she was a production designer. So the exterior was also part of Raleigh Studios. I, I watched an entire featurette about how they built up this prison facade and then built up the inside cells. They made it look like it was run down. The funniest thing that I found, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the prison brick facade is actually like a squishy, almost wallpaper covering. So people would walk up to it and be like, wow, this brick looks really cool. And it would like squish, right? <laughs> because... <laughs> It was just a wallpaper. <laughs> it's still a, it's still impressive though. Right. For yeah. this for this point that it, we know that they've been very budget conscious at that network, mm -hmm. so it's a very impressive that they pulled that so off. So it's like a, a vinyl wall sticker. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Okay. The other thing that, that I wanted to bring up is that the the bars for the prison are actual steel. They built it themselves. So yes, when you're hearing the clang, it really is steel on all those doors. Awesome. Yes. 
So when they all show up at the prison, Rick uses wire cutters to clip the prison fence. Glenn and Maggie are taking out the walkers and they leave the cars parked outside the fence for now. The group enters the first set of fences because there's like a perimeter corridor that's enclosed by like two circles of fencing. So you can walk around the outside of the prison in between these two fences. There's also a river nearby, which could be very useful if it's clean or they can fish. And then after they go through the fence, they tie the hole closed with some, it looks like cording or some like... It looks like electrical cord. Something, yeah. like electrical well, cord. Well, I see that he actually twists it together, so mm-hmm. I think it's actually like bendable wire. Right. That's in a coating. And I think we're going to, in this episode especially, I think we're going to figure out there are a lot of really common household things that you can pick up that are so incredibly useful. You would never know. At this point, all the walkers start heading toward the interior fence toward them because they're like, oh, more food. And snackies. So they're running around the corridor to the prison entrance. So they talk about how they can shut the upper yard gate. So it's the gate before you get to the actual prison to enclose the yard area so they can just pick off the walkers in the yard first. So Glenn volunteers to be the one to get the gate closed as normal. He wants to be the quick bunny. (laughs) And Maggie holds him back. Yeah, like, nope. Rick decides that this is the plan. Glenn, Maggie, Beth, and T-Dog run to the side to distract some and kill them through the fence. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the best ways to get rid of these guys because you are the bait, but you have the fence's protection. And there is a lot of surface area around this yard. So even if the walkers start piling up next to the fence, you simply continue to move around the fence perimeter and they just keep coming at you and you can just keep hitting them. Yeah, you don't want them piling up because they could ultimately take down the fence. But yeah, Yeah, if you spread Mm -hmm. out, they will have to spread out and lose their force. Also, T-Dog has one of the best weapons for this job at the moment. He has what looks to be a fire poker, but he uses it like a short spear. And spears, javelins can be used, especially if used in close quarter with good aim, they can be very good against these zombies because you just shoot it right through their eye, through their mouth, up through their chin. In fact, Roman legionary tactics are really good. If we watch later in the series, they actively train in Roman legionary tactics, Mm -hmm. and they're very effective. And we see Glenn switch from his spade in this episode to a piece of pipe with jagged edges because he gave his machete to Maggie. Mm -hmm. So the next prong of attack is Daryl and Carol go to one of the prison towers, Herschel and Carl go to the other. Those are the two that are closest to where they are right now that they can get to from the perimeter fence. And Carl is not using his silencer in these scenes. So everybody's going up there and everybody's you know shooting their own guns or bows and he's using a different gun entirely. You can see the gun with the silencer sticking out of his, his side bag. Mm, gotcha. So then Rick volunteers to run for the gate and Daryl hands him what looks like two really large carabiners with a chain that connects them. So I want to bring up the use of these things. I'm like, yes, mm-hmm. so smart, but we will get there. Lori's weapon of choice is a screwdriver. I personally think she needs a longer weapon than a a screwdriver. That is far too short. Yeah, there are bigger screwdrivers uh, that she probably could have used. Right. You you have some that are over a foot long. Right. Go for that. I mean, they clearly hit up some hardware store or some other store because of some of these weapons that they have and these carabiners and chains and other things. I just don't understand the screwdriver, but whatever. They get Rick through the gate, and there is a huge vehicle that's turned on its side right in front of the gate. You know, who knows what the story is on this one? Did they use it to transport? Did they use it for protection? What's the story, do you think? That, that actually is one of the prison transport buses, and it looks like they, some of the remaining staff took it and flipped it on its side right next to that entrance mm-hmm. to keep people from driving in and out. Which, as we will talk about the signs later that are in that front part, it looked like it was a drive into prison mm-hmm. area. So Rick is using a gun to clear while he goes for the gate. And my first thought was, well, doesn't this draw the walkers that are trying to be lured to the fence hitters? Yep, that's exactly what happened here. Yep. Even though he's using his own professional suppressor, so... Like, he shouldn't be making as much noise. Mm -hmm. 
but still, he's get he's drawing in all the ones that are nearby him. Right, right. Yeah. So Rick uses the carabiners to keep the gate closed. So he shuts it, and he takes it and he clips them to either side of the gate opening to keep it closed. So you can open it like a little bit, it looks like, but not all the way. Mm -hmm. And this is super smart because if you are going to be using that gate to go in and out a lot, you want to be able to have a way to open it. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a great idea. Um, so then he goes to the tower that's right next to the gate and goes up and he continues to shoot the walkers in the yard. A couple more people are entering the prison yard and killing the walkers. If you notice, none of the slides on their pistols move when the rounds are fired. And there are no spent shells that are ejected. And this is mostly true for the people that are like outside the yard or in the towers. There are a couple times where you can see it, but most of the time, nothing's happening. Here. So it seems kind. Of, and I also noticed that they they didn't really behave as if their guns actually had kickback at all. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they pretty much just held their guns out and just kind of bobbed them, and then gunshot effects were probably digitally added right. later on. Which is silly because later on Carol complains of the kickback. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Then we see that Rick is up on the tower, kind of seeing what's happening. Rick's watch here says... I think it says 4.58. Yeah, I couldn't really tell. I thought it was around 6.30, but I'll allow 4.58. You can tell it's getting close to dusk. As we join the people that are back in the front part of the prison yard, we're going to look at some of the signs that are there. There's, there's a sign that says a violation of any laws posted or not posted will result in immediate arrest. No cell phones allowed outside of the personal vehicle. Do not exit vehicle unless instructed. Have ID ready. Turn off engine. No stopping a long road. Do not talk to inmates. Visitors will be escorted from grounds and may be subject to arrest. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the group goes into the yard and Lori says she hasn't felt this good in weeks. I'm thinking it's an adrenaline high. The promise of a place where they can feel more secure. Everyone is happy. They think, oh, this place is going to hold us for a while. There's a lot of potential here. A place of doom becomes a haven of hope. Theoretically. <laughs> yeah. Well, nothing's permanent. I'm not right. saying that. <laughs> but that's what they're looking for, you know? Yeah. So in uh, after the like commercial break, we see in the prison yard that it looks like they have moved their vehicles up to the outside of the main prison gate. So you have their vehicles, the prison gate, and the overturned bus. Mm -hmm. All right, that's where it is. Daryl is on top of the bus, uh, and he's in a very festive poncho. <laughs> Did you see that poncho? It was like, wow. <laughs> I, I frequently remember this poncho almost as much as I remember his jacket. Right. Oh, and the poncho is a reference to Clint Eastwood in the Spaghetti oh, Westerns. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, yeah. So the rest of the group has a campfire going in the yard. And this is a really good place for them to rest until the next day when they can clear some more. And you can see that Maggie's actually cooking off of her machete. So there was also something else I saw in passing and never went by to really check and make sure I was right. It also looked like they were cooking on top of a grate for a fan. It was kind of like this wire covering. Yeah, that sounds about right. It may have been something that they scavenged and they're like, right. hey, we could totally build a fire and then use this as a as a cooking grill. Right. So Rick is pacing the perimeter. T-Dog mentions they could dig a canal under the fence to get water from the river. And while this might be a good idea, even a hole under the fence could bring the zombies too. So I'm not sure this is the best idea. Why can't you just walk outside the fence and get some water and come back? It may be one of those things where he's just kind of like dreaming. Mm -hmm. But also, even if you were to dig that, you could very easily try and take some of the cell doors, uh, remove them from the walls. It would take a lot of work. But you remove the cell doors, put some of the cell doors there instead. Mm -hmm. And now you have sure. a, a secure opening. Herschel mentions using the yard to farm. And soybeans, if put in good soil, can be excellent food source. Grains would take up way too much space for farming, but beans and root vegetables would be a great choice. Mm. Carol decides to bring Daryl some food as he's pacing on top of the bus. At this point, Daryl calls Rick Little Shane. Mm. I, I think because they think Rick is going to fly off the handle any moment, kind of like they thought Shane was. Mm-hmm. 
Carol mentions that Shane could never have brought them as far as Rick has, and they seem to be less angry at him than at the end of season two and trust him more now than they did then, because, like, when he told them what he did to Shane, they were all like, we can't trust you. But it's also taken eight months to find a prison that wasn't that far away from what we see, so anything could have happened in these eight months. It's also yeah. kind of fair weather, in a sense, too. They're all in a good mood because mm-hmm. they found this place, so they're going to have hope in right. that but it's circumstantial because if he goes off the deep end again they'll be like that's right. concerned. carol kind of complains about having a sore muscles from the kickback of the gun so daryl helps her with a little massage there's a moment that they have almost like they're trying to imply that there could be something there i don't know if this was a storyline that they were considering going down carol, but daryl. as we all know nothing really comes of this right <laughs> So even Carol's like, do you want to screw around? (laughs) And then they kind of laugh like it's the stupidest idea ever. And then Daryl says he will go down first, meaning off the bus. And Carol says, even better. Really, Carol? (laughs) Really? (laughs) I don't remember these lines, but like her being this funny with him, being joking and poking with him, like she's finally opening up. She's finally like letting herself be. Mm Mm-hmm. With these people. Oh, since she's away from the trauma of Sophia and the trauma of Ed, she is now kind of coming into her own a little bit more. Yeah. On the campfire, Herschel asks Beth to sing Patty Riley, and Maggie goes, oh, no, 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 don't sing that. And then uh, I had to look up. Patty Riley is a folk singer and guitarist. There is also a song by the Dubliners called Come Back Patty Riley. That's probably what it is. It's probably mm-hmm. this song. And I believe this song is, doesn't he say it's your mom's favorite or something like that? Mm-hmm. And so the, like that's why Maggie doesn't want to hear it because you know she mm. it's right. too close to the morning for her. So then he requests the parting glass. And Beth and Maggie both sing this song. So a little bit about this song. It is a Scottish traditional song often sung at the end of a gathering of friends. It was purportedly the most popular parting song sung in Scotland before Robert Burns wrote Auld Lang Syne. The lyrics, and I have put down basically the second verse. They sing both the first and the second verse. And I have, in my research, it basically says that the verses are all interchangeable. They don't necessarily sing them in the same order every time. But in the order that they sing them in, this is the second verse. And I think it has some meaning here. So I kind of want to talk about it. The lyrics are, of all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I gently rise and softly call, good night and joy be to you all. I had been looking at this whole song that they sung and I watched what was going on and you can see different characters get the the camera focus when they sing certain lines and it it matches up so when they prominently figure rick during portions where they sing and all the harm i e'er done alas it was to none but me and this is very much about shane mm-hmm. and the people that he's killed and he's kind of working his way through that and all i've done for want of wit it switches to herschel because all of the problems that they were having at the farm, part of it was Herschel's fault right. because he wasn't really thinking things through, and that's his trauma. Right. It's talking directly about the issues they dealt in dealt with in the previous season. I think the line where they say, "And since it falls into my lot that I should rise and you should not," is actually very I, that kind of hit me the most. I think because one of the uh, slogans that they had for the show was "Rise." It happened much farther along in the series but i think here we talk about you know the rising of the dead the the walkers are rising like but they're also talking about people who rise above the situation that i should rise and you know you are dead basically but at the same time you are bestowing a blessing it actually makes me think of and this is going to make you guys laugh but it makes me really think of like Marie Kondo I'm watching the (laughs) the Sparking Joy TV series and she does this when she does the clean outs of the tidying of her houses but she always will thank the space she will ask the space if she can come in and then she blesses the things that you give away and she says you know thank you for your role in my life 
and now you're on to another purpose. And I, for some reason, when they say the whole part about you softly call good night and joy be to you, made me think of that where yeah. she was like, yes, you're a walker. Yes, I have to kill you. But here's the blessing for being on this earth at some point in another form. That also reminds me of like when the Lord of the Rings, when they did their productions, they always started mm -hmm. off with a Maori blessing to the sound stages right. so they brought people in to say this is we know this is your land we respectfully use it but we want you to be able to bless it at this point rick tells the group they need to sweep the prison so they can have access to everything the prison might have and he's talking about food and medical supplies and weapons mm -hmm. then rick and Lori have a conversation about how she thinks people are too exhausted to clear the prison but he is worried about having a place for the baby which is a valid point so then the two of them kind of go off and Lori says that they need to talk about things. And Rick says, well, if you want to talk, just talk to Herschel. And here we see that there is a lot of tension happening between the two of them. And I think he might be getting a little bit more than tired of the damage done by her being like, oh, I just want to talk. And mm -hmm. then, great, now I have to kill my best friend again. Right. Because I think, you know, he still kind of holds it against her that she poked the bear. And we talked about that in that episode where she poked Shane and basically was like giving Shane a little more hope than she needed to. And that really was the final straw mm -hmm. <laughs> there. Um, Rick just seems to be carrying a lot of the weight of a lot of the people that are here mm -hmm. and a lot of the people that aren't here. <laughs> you know, it's probably all the weight. But we do go to another, another place. We're going into town. Now we are at the Case General Store that is on 2 Main Street, and this is in Harrelson, Georgia, so we are not in Sonoya anymore. We're in mm -hmm. Harrelson. Rick and Glenn first passed this particular location, not necessarily this particular store in the series, but this location set in Season 2, Episode 8, when they were trying to find Herschel at the bar. This is one of the set areas that they used for this. So in this store, we see Michonne, and this is the actual Michonne, not stunt double Michonne as we saw it last season. So this is her first appearance. It is not faux shown. Michonne. It's not faux shown. No. So let's talk a little bit about her. Corey, tell us about this actress. So this is Denai Guerrera. She's mostly known as uh, Okoye in Black Panther and the Avengers movies and the What If. But she also played Michonne in Robot Chicken, which I think is really cool that she did that and didn't make Seth Green do that voice. That's mm -hmm. good. She was in a show that I really liked, a David Simon show called Treme about uh, New Orleans after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And remember, everyone is super excited that Michonne is finally here because everyone loves her from the comics. So I feel like this is a real turning point because we have someone who is female who isn't already like scrambling to try to figure out what she's supposed to do in this apocalyptic situation. She's already doing it. She's got the system with the pets. Yeah, she, exactly. And, and, like she figured it out fairly she quickly. She has a, a signature weapon. Um, you will find out in many more seasons what her backstory really is. And I find it to be fascinating, um, but yeah. we will get there. I've read it as well too, so yeah. Right. So like I said, she has a signature weapon. It is the katana. I watched a couple featurettes about how they use the katana, how she trained with it. She was given choreography, yes, but she also did a little bit of training in how you're supposed to use a katana. But nine times out of 10, when she's killing someone with a katana, there is no blade. It is CGI'd into it so that it, you know, it keeps people safe, but also that way they can just CGI what happens to the person and the blade together. And it's just one seamless move. She sees the two walkers and bam, just skewers them both at once because she's that type of person. And since we're talking about katanas, let me ask you guys, what is the primary weapon used by samurai? Well, it's not the, it isn't the katana, right? Isn't it their fists? It is not a katana. Most often, the samurai would end up using longbows and spears. Ah. Again, spears are one of the best weapons in a zombie apocalypse, mm -hmm. but katana is designed as a battlefield weapon. But if you don't use the proper technique, it will get stuck in your opponent. Right. And if this is a traditional katana, which I don't think it is, I think this is an American-made mass market katana which contains chromium, it would need regular maintenance to keep it from rusting. 
And despite a lot of reddits and message boards being like, oh my gosh, I have a katana, I'm going to survive the, the apocalypse. No, there is a lot better weapons for a zombie apocalypse than mm -hmm. a katana. It's just a really stylish weapon. I did a little bit of like background checking for things you could get at this store currently or at some point. There is a sign for fish bait of different kinds. The windows say it's deli, hardware, and grocery. On this shelf, you can see metal watering cans, a ceramic cat, and then on the floor is aspirin, and Michonne grabs that aspirin up. They are in the prison yard again. They're about to enter into the main prison area. There is a big sign that reads, stop, wait for clearance. And I busted up laughing because that's exactly what they're going to do. Except they're not going to wait. They're going to clear. Everyone else needs to wait for clearance. Yes. <laughs> So Rick, T-Dog, Maggie, Glenn, and Daryl get ready to start killing more walkers while Herschel mans the gate. The rest of the group does the outside the gate distraction, make some noise so that they can take him out at the gate. Inside the prison, they're using this like circle formation where their backs are all to each other in a circle and they're facing out. Until T-Dog breaks rank to grab a police shield. Yeah. But this is helpful. This is a helpful thing. Yes, it is. Because, again, shield. Roman legionary tactic. Right. But uh, what we're seeing them use here looks very similar to kind of like a, a SWAT team tactic mm -hmm. where you, you keep in a cluster to have maximum visibility. And you do have a breacher who goes through and right. breaks down doors and then gets out of the way for everybody else to defend them. The group turns the corner and they see a huge amount of walkers in another part of the yard. There are guys in body armor and face shields. So Daryl goes up and tries to shoot one of them in the face and it bounces off him. And I'm like, Daryl, <laughs> you're smarter than this. What made you think that you should shoot an arrow into a helmet? Well, I mean, it shoots in the face shield. And yes, the face shields are designed to be strong, but I don't think it's actually designed for that. Like, I, right. I feel like it shouldn't be something that an arrow should just bounce off of. Rather comically, I might add. It's right. a bong. <laughs> oh. The riot armor helmets are rated for small arms fire, but I don't mm. think that extends to the faceplate. I could be wrong. Right. But then Rick tr tries to clobber one over the head. Again, you see this knife bonk. <laughs> <laughs> Why? This is so funny. I like, I spent most of the scene just laughing my head off, really. Then they decide they're going to shut the next gate inside the prison yard with more carabiners. This is a different set. The carabiners are actually smaller this time, but it's still the same idea. Two carabiners on a chain. And because of that, I really feel like carabiners on a chain need to be added to everybody's apocalypse gear kit. Yeah, for sure. I, we're seeing that this is becoming a very handy item. So after multiple helmet thuds, they have learned their lesson, Maggie finally kills one by shoving the knife under their chin. And Obviously. you see this, there's they pause on Maggie's face and she gets this like gleeful, childlike expression expression that she's got now got an upgrade. Yeah, she's skill, like, Did you see that? Skill upgrade. <laughs> Achievement unlocked. Yeah, so everyone else follows suit. Let's get them all in a vulnerable spot, obviously. There's a method that Daryl uses to do it from the back of the neck. Obviously, another vulnerable spot all around the neck. He pushes his helmet forward and drives the knife into the base of the walker's skull. And this is one of the sentry neutralization techniques taught by the U.S. Army, mm -hmm. which I believe, yep. Rick kills one of them and then looks at himself and his bloody arms like, man, I could really use a shower right now. <laughs> and the thing is, those this one that he kills right now and then he peels the mask off of it taking a lot oh yeah that's the gross okay. one yeah yeah but it has a gas mask no helmet so when she swung at this first walker and it bounced off it didn't have a helmet no that is funny they decide they're going to push into the prison to clear some more so into the prison they go to perform the stealthy search mm, too bad the prison has other plans this place is so noisy. It's all the steel. Yeah. Yeah, steel on steel, baby. Yep. So Rick goes up to a guard post that's in the main room. It's kind of overlooking the rest of the area. The guard is dead, but he does find keys. That's important. They go into C block, the first place they look, and they're like, there's no one here. 
awesome. We have some beds. We have like a two-story cell formation, one long hallway. It's small enough that we can all be here securely and, and know what's happening to each other, but it's big enough that we're not like legitimately sitting on each other's feet, you know? And there's also this area where the, the staircases go up to the second level mm -hmm. that is blocked off with chain link. Mm -hmm. That's that's a nice secure area to go to and mm -hmm. uh, we end up seeing that daryl claims it for himself later on maggie goes into a cell with a dead guy on the floor and if you look really closely there is a stool and it's literally right next to the front of the toilet okay so you have two places to, to sit that are right next to each other and in the featurettes on the dvd steven yoon 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 in the DVD, Stephen Yun was making fun of the fact that if you were super lazy and just needed to pee, you could sit on the stool and aim into the toilet because they're right next to each other. He called it their deluxe model. <laughs> I know, right? There were a couple of cells with walkers in it. They clear those. They bring the group in and say they're going to try to find the infirmary in the cafeteria tomorrow. Lori tells Rick, thank you. And he just walks away. So I put, he's mad at her. Why? We find out later why. We don't need to ask this question. We figure it out. Daryl, like Marshall said, is taking the perch. And I would have suggested that he takes that perch anyway, because you want the guy that's the most aware of their surroundings to be in a position to be like, something's here. Right. Yeah, I honestly don't think that's why he did it. I think he did it. If you look at his expression, he's laying down. He's not on watch. And he's smiling. He's smiling because I am not going in one of those cells again. I really think he spent some time at some point. He had a big brother that was a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. He got to be doing some time at some point. And so you see him like, ha ha, all you suckers going into those iron cages. I'm not right? doing that. So that's the that's really the vibe I got off of it. Yes, yeah. it is strategic, but I don't think it, it, it never really read uh, I, that way. A good point there. I think mm -hmm. you're right. Beth goes into a cell, and Carl follows after her. They have a discussion about how they used to live in a storage units for a while, they and how the smell again. was that's really the beauty bad. Of it. Yeah, Carl clearly is going to bunk with Beth. So he starts taking off his pack, but then Herschel comes in and he plays it off like he's just making sure that she's safe. I'm not really bunking your dad, Herschel. Yeah. So he has a crush, I'm guessing. And they kind of showed a little bit when they were at the campfire, the way that he was reacting to her singing. Like he kind of looked at her like, oh my gosh. Right. Like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Stuff. Herschel gives Beth like a laughing look and then Beth's just like, whatever. <laughs> I don't really care. So Beth and Herschel are in a cell together. Maggie and Glenn are in a cell together. And Glenn starts checking her for scratches. And, you know, isn't that just a great rep ritual for couples during an apocalypse? It's like, it's not checking for lice. It's checking for scratches. Then Carol and Lori are together in a cell. We think that Carl is going to bunk with Rick, but we never really see Rick go into a cell. He kind of just hangs in the hallway by himself, <laughs> really. There's a song playing, which is called Noisy Sunday, and it's by Patrick Wilson. And here are the lyrics. It's late in the night. It's late in the night for a storm. It's quiet again. Too much for noise to go home. To fill up the space. To fill up the rooms on Sunday afternoon. For you lonely ears waiting for something to break this calm. Send you my love in this song. What does this even mean? I have no clue. There's a lot of times songs aren't picked for... You know, the Dawson's Creek method where the actual lyrics are literally narrating what right. is going on in the episode. Sometimes it's more like the vibe or the mood of the song itself, the music of the mm -hmm. song. Because this is a very kind of sweet, melancholy song. Right. Let's go back to the town where Michonne is just literally standing there watching walkers walk around, basically. She walks into the Sportsman's Deer Cooler. This is at 49 Addy Street in Harrelson, Georgia. Currently, this is a four bedroom, two bath house. So she has her two pet walkers. They don't have any jarms. Jarms. That's it, jarms. That's the jaw arm combination, yes. yeah. jarms. There is a sign on the door that says, the buck stops here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> she goes into the back and we see Andrea and she's very sick. Now remember, we didn't really know what happened to Andrea, except that we knew that Michonne had found her. Mm -hmm. 
So it's been eight months, and so she is sick somehow. The aspirin is for her. Andrea reveals that they have been hanging out all winter. She tells Michonne to go because the herd is coming, and Michonne says they will go in a few days. They have a very large conversation that whatever. (laughs) It's just them arguing about it. Uh, Ultimately, they decide to leave to get out of the way of the herd. Then we go back to the prison and they have found some more weapons. There's quite a bit of things that they are laying out on the table here. Yeah, they've harvested a lot of stuff from all of those uh, zombies that they've already killed. And the riot gear is coated in slime. So the skin contact areas are now dangerous to use. You can't use a lot of the Kevlar, but the armor pads that are designed to protect from bludgeoning weapons, they won't necessarily be quite as useful, but they still use them anything. anyway. So you get... You're going to see in later scenes, you see T-Dog, and he is wearing the plastic armor pads. Right. Carol calls Herschel to Lori, and Lori says to Herschel she hasn't felt the baby move. So she's afraid that if the baby dies, it will turn into the undead inside of her. And this is terrifying. It's a centipede. It's a terrifying thought to me. Well, it's, you know, it's the whole alien concept it's body horror right in effect you have the enemy growing inside of you yeah. that is terrifying he's coming from inside the house <laughs> <laughs> See, so also says well what if she dies during childbirth ironic. well this is really ironic and she asks to be killed immediately if she turns as everyone really does at this point. I think, knowing what we know, and you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. this is a conversation she needs to be having with other people as well, not just Herschel. Yeah. Because we kind of know how this is going to turn out and who is with her when this all goes down. Mm-hmm. Lori says Carl won't look at her and Rick blames her for what happened with Shane. And she's starting to really feel remorseful and take responsibility for what her role was in that Mm -hmm. whole situation. The guys are gearing up to go explore. The guys and Maggie, I should say. Rick tells Carl he needs to take care of things at C-Block. So this is the season that Carl becomes like this little soldier and grows up. He doesn't whine about being left behind and he accepts the responsibility that his job, his role, is to protect the group. And if someone says to him, hey, I need you to stay here and look out for things, he is proud to have that role and he will do it. This is part of the refreshing thing I was talking about earlier Mm -hmm. with Carl. Mm -hmm. And it's also a lot in how Rick puts it because when somebody's like, oh, I want to go and they're kind of rebelling you, you're saying, no, I'm leaving you behind because I actually trust you and you're capable. You're the person that is right for this job. They'll be a lot more likely to accept a responsibility that they don't want if they feel like it's a position of honor. Right. So as they're searching the prison, they're finding a lot of bodies on the ground. And because it is a maze, Glenn is using spray paint on the walls to tag arrows so they know how to exit if they when they start coming back. And I feel like, especially since they've been through several different stores, that they, they should have picked up some chalk. Mm. I feel like these spray cans actually have a much better use, especially in this building. Because you can use the chalk to mark where you're going, sure, but this building is a cement construction building. It is invulnerable to fire. And spray cans now make instant flamethrowers. Since you can burn them, close the doors, lock the doors, walk away, you now don't have to worry about the zombies. Interesting. The group hears a thud and they see a lot of walkers, at which point Herschel trips over a corpse hand. Yeah. And at this point, we're all cringing because we're like, nope, nothing happens. (laughs) Around another corner, they see more walkers. So here's all these walkers coming at him. It seems like they keep getting trapped. And I keep on wondering, why is T-Dog and his shield not out in the front of the group right now? Right. It keeps on being like Maggie and Glenn. Yeah, but then Maggie and Glenn get separated from everyone else somehow. I don't know. It's really hard to see what's happening in some of these scenes, so I just summarized the best I could. Herschel is trying to find Glenn and Maggie, and vice versa. They're trying to find each other. So Herschel's kind of not really paying attention, steps over a body he thinks is all the way dead, not just walking dead. And it's not, and it takes a bite out of his legs. And this marks the first time an appendage has been bitten 
as that opposed to a neck or close body to part. a yeah. body. Right. Marshall, I'm going to get on jump on your thing because I actually found the actual from the production reason that this happens. Great. They are called lurkers. Lurkers are zombies who are in an environment where there's not there's no more food. There's no there's nothing going on. There's lack of stimulation. So they literally just kind of power down. We see, we'll see a big version of this in season 11 they're in a giant facility and there's just a bunch of uh, zombies lying down and like they they're think asleep they're all... almost yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a sleep mode for them so it is a thing it's called they're called lurkers and Great. so this is the first instance where we see one yeah no that's that's exactly it because like we have basically through our own an- analysis we have said smart zombie is a thing mm-hmm. and now we have the lurker zombies and we have standard shamblers and like I've seen the the lurker zombie and other, it's kind of like a form of torpor where they're yeah they're just low on food, so I'm just gonna hang out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they find Herschel, and they also find what looks like a cafeteria, and they shut themselves in it, and they turn a cat Herschel's leg, and it is a split second decision. Rick grabs the axe and just whoom cuts off Herschel's leg. Uh, this will save Herschel's life really they don't really know that it for sure will save his life because they don't really know how the infection spreads how the zombie virus spreads so this is really just a chance at this point Mm -hmm. in their minds if they cut it off they did it in time and he can heal and he doesn't get infected from other things this might be a chance for him to remain alive and the chances are actually pretty high because they got to it really quick and that's going to keep it from spreading too far. Mm-hmm. The problem is, especially at his age, Herschel could simply die from the shock of the exactly. amputation. Yeah. The one thing I want to add here, though, is as we saw in the intro to the show, a hacksaw is definitely a good thing to have on hand if you can because it was really troublesome for Rick to actually chop through the bone mm-hmm. with that axe. So right. that it would be good to be able to, especially because... You could do it a lot quicker and not yeah. have to exert as much force. Behind them, behind a closed grate into like what looks like the kitchen of part of the cafeteria, they see five shadows, so they think it's walkers. They turn around, and Daryl like, gets his arrow ready. And then you realize these are actual men. And we will talk all about them in our next episode as this is the end of this episode so let's close up with talking about a few things the first thing is let's talk about the title seed what does this really mean in this context like my first thought was are we speaking of the seed of rick or shane are we speaking of the seed of being planted into this prison what what did you think the title means here let's discuss Spent most of the episode being like, I don't know what this title is all about. I mean, I think on the surface, it's about the the opportunity to actually have put down roots and Mm -hmm. actually have like a place to actually plant stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But beyond that, you're. I think you're right. There is some psychological underpinnings that uh, that it's kind of leading to. But specifically, I don't know. I mean, there's. There's Rick's issues with Lori kind of affect him and Carl, so I, I really don't know specifically beyond that. Let's talk about the comics. As you know, I read the comics alongside watching these episodes. This episode begins the Safety Behind Bars story arc from the comics. And in the comic, it was Dale and a character named Alan, rather than Herschel, who had their leg amputated, although this doesn't happen in the same place that this happens with Herschel. The writers like to diverge from the original story to keep the viewers guessing a little bit, obviously. When we start this in the comics, Glenn, Maggie, and Herschel are not at the prison with the rest of the group. They are actually still back at the farm because they didn't want to go with the group. So then they find the prison and they decide, because they see the yard space, oh, we need people who know about farming. Let's go get this group. So they go get them. After clearing the outside prison, Rick and Tyrese, who is not with us yet in the show, but is in the comics, find the empty prison. They kind of stumble upon the cafeteria and there's four guys and they're like sitting at a table and they're just eating meatloaf. Like, hey, what's up? You guys want some meatloaf? Because... 
They explain, they think they're getting rescued by Rick and Tyrese, but they explain that right before the last of the people either left the prison or were killed off, some of the guards locked them in to the cafeteria. So that's why they are currently there in the comics. They think they're getting rescued. They obviously find out that's not true later. So we'll go to the next part of it when we go to our next episode, which is next week, season three, episode two, sick. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. <laughs>